So uh, the theme of this conference, TEDx Chelsea, is that art is seldom worth what someone is willing to pay for it. Um, what I want to talk about is actually what you get, you know, what, what you're buying when you pay for a work of art. So uh, we have here a painting of the flowers by Andy Warhol. Um, let's say you had $1.2 million to spend on a work of art and you bought this. Uh, what is it that you own? Um, certainly you own the canvas itself, what lawyers would call the real property, but what you don't own is the intellectual property on the work. And despite the fact that Andy Warhol has been dead for you know, 20 years, more or less, uh, his estate still maintains the copyright on any work that he made. Um, so copyright in this country was initially for 14 years and could then be renewed for 14 additional years. Currently, it lasts for the life of the artist plus 70 years. So in the case of Andy Warhol, uh, his work is all under copyright until 2057. Now, the purpose of copyright was to promote uh, progress in the arts and sciences by giving artists, writers, musicians, uh, inventors some kind of protection on their work so that they had a financial incentive to spend all the time uh, making it. The problem with this is that if we look at the history of art in the 20th century, um, a lot of the most important works incorporate copywritten material. So this is an early collage by Pablo Picasso. It's from 1913. Uh, it's a still life on the right is a bottle of wine, then there's a guitar in the middle, and underneath it is a newspaper. Instead of painting or drawing the newspaper, Picasso actually collaged a piece of newsprint onto the surface of this work. The issue is that a newspaper, of course, is copyrighted material and can't be uh, reproduced under the law. But collage was really important in the development of Cubism, of Surrealism, of Dada, and really the uh, development of modern art. I think this is not the kind of thing that we want to call an illegal or a criminal behavior. Uh, with them with the 60s, uh, pop art, we have artists not looking at the world as they see it around them with their eyes, but through the filter of the mass media. So on the top, we have a comic book panel, and underneath it, a painting by Roy Lichtenstein. So he's obviously made some changes to the color and the composition here. He certainly changed the context. He's brought it from a low or a popular art context in the comic book into a high art context of a gallery or a museum. But I think clearly this work is you know, heavily dependent on the source material. Or Andy Warhol, who uh, you know, basically made his name creating works based on copywritten material from other artists. So uh, you know, this is not a photograph of Marilyn Monroe that Andy Warhol took himself. It's something that he found in a newspaper or a magazine, created a silk screen, and made a series of paintings. Uh, he also worked with a lot of things that would fall under trademark instead of copyright. You know, Campbell's Soup, uh, Brillo, uh, Coca-Cola. These are not brands that he licensed or had any you know, right to use, but uh, were things that were around him, and so he chose them as subject matter. Then in the 80s, we had the rise of appropriation art. This is a photograph by Richard Prince. He didn't go out west and photograph a cowboy. He photographed a uh, Marlboro advertisement and cropped it so that there was no text and uh, presented this as his own work. Uh, or perhaps more uh, drastically, Sherry Levine. On the left is a photograph by Walker Evans. Sherry Levine re-photographed this image and a number of other photographs by Evans and presented them as her own work after Walker Evans. So I think art historians would all agree that these are important pieces that changed the course of art history uh, and, and vital works. How do we square the protections of copyright law with its stated purpose to promote progress in the arts? Well, there is something called the fair use exception, which says that there are certain cases where you can reproduce copyrighted materials. So that would be uh, criticism, commentary, news reporting, or educational use, and that's kind of why we're able to show uh, copyrighted images uh, on this lecture today. Now, the problem is that fair use is notoriously vague, and there are a number of guidelines that the courts look at in determining fair use, but they're just that, they're guidelines. There's nothing that's hard and fast that says you can use 10% you know, of a painting, or 1%, or 70%, and that's okay, but if you go over that, it's not. It's, it's really kind of a judgment call. Um, with artwork, we're mainly looking at the first uh, 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 one of these, the purpose and character. And what we look at is, is the use uh, transformative? Is it saying something new and different? Or is it derivative and basically a substitute for the original and thus uh, an infringement of copyright? So um, despite the fact that you bought that Warhol painting and you paid, spent $1.2 million, you do not have the right to put it on a t-shirt or a tote bag or a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, these are all things that the Andy Warhol estate licenses. They make a lot of money. They don't want you cutting in on that. These would all be considered derivative uses of that copyright. So until 2057, and then you can make all these that you want, uh, this is the property of Warhol's estate. 
um, something like a, a film adaptation of a book would also fall under derivative works, right? The author has the right to sell the film rights to his or her novel. Um, but what's a transformative use is something that's a lot less clear, and I think especially in the world of uh, fine arts. So uh, The Fountain by Marcel Duchamp, uh, you know, very famously he just bought a urinal from a plumbing supply store, turned it on its side, signed it with a pseudonym, and presented it as a work of art. Um, very small transformation, but it's a groundbreaking piece. You know, it's now considered one of the most important, if not the most important works of the 20th century. And that's because Duchamp was saying the artist can make a very minimal gesture, basically just selecting something and transform it into a work of art. That's something that was incredibly radical at the time and it's something that I think that the laws still have trouble kind of uh, addressing uh, you know, in contemporary society. Now, one of the problems is that uh, a lot of uh, copyright cases are settled before they work their way through the court system. So we don't actually know whether use is fair or not. So this is a pretty famous recent example. On the right, we have Shepard Ferry's Obama Hope poster. On the left is a photograph which the AP, the Associated Press, owned the rights to, uh, which was the source material. The AP uh, brought a lawsuit against Shepard Ferry for copyright infringement. Um, but before this was actually completely decided by the courts, they wound up settling. And so we don't know what the eventual decision would have been, whether this would be a fair use or not. Um, somewhat ironically, the AP, of course, was able to reproduce Shepard Ferry's poster uh, because they have fair use protection for news reporting. So they didn't have to license it or get any kind of permission to uh, publish it. Um, so Jeff Koons is an artist who actually uh, has had a couple of cases go through the courts. Uh, this was the first one, and uh, on the bottom we have Kunz's sculpture, String of Puppies. Above it is a photograph by Art Rogers, which had been uh, printed as a postcard, which Jeff Kunz bought in a souvenir stand and used as the source material for the sculpture. Now, even though Kunz enlarged the work, brought it into three dimensions, added color, and made some changes, um, most noticeably the faces of the puppies and the flowers and the hair of the two people, uh, the court decided that this was, in fact, not a fair use and that he had infringed the copyright on the original image. Um, so that was not considered to be a fair use. That was derivative. Um, uh, so a couple years later, uh, Coons was involved in another copyright case. This went over a painting called Niagara, which is uh, here on the right. So the second pair of feet in from the left was taken from uh, a photograph that had been published in Allure magazine, which is shown on the left here. The woman who took that photograph, Andrea Blanche, uh, sued Jeff Koons over copyright infringement. And in this case, uh, the courts decided that uh, Koons had not infringed the copyright and this was, in fact, a fair use of the image. So I think you know, this sort of goes to show that it's very difficult if you're an artist working with appropriated imagery to know whether you're on the right side of the law or on the wrong side. Now, being a defendant didn't stop Jeff Koons from threatening uh, copyright uh, action of his own. On the left, we have his sculpture, Balloon Dog. On the right is a, st a, a bookend that was being sold by a store in San Francisco. Koons sent them a cease and desist letter saying, you've got to stop selling this. This is derivative of my work. Um, they said, no, we're not going to stop. And he wisely, I think, backed down because he basically had appropriated a folk art form that had been going on for decades before he created the sculpture. I think it would be very difficult for Koons to uh, you know, present that this was his intellectual property. Now, the most re recent case uh, is that of Patrick Carey versus Richard Prince. So Patrick Carey was a French photographer who published a book called Yes Rasta that was a series of photographs he'd taken in Jamaica. On the left, we have one of his photographs. Richard Prince made a series of paintings called the Canal Zone series, uh, which incorporated many images from Patrick Carey's book. So on the right, we have one of uh, Prince's paintings from this series. So he basically scanned in a page of the book. He enlarged it. Uh, this, the actual painting is about life size. He changed the color a little bit. He added this guitar, which is from a different photographer's image, and did some kind of overpainting over the, uh, the man's face. This one, you know, I think is fairly minorly transformed, but other pieces had a lot more that were going on. So this one, we have that same Rastafarian. Uh, the nude woman is taken from a different uh, photographer's work. The background is kind of a collage, some taken from Patrick Carey's book and some from uh, other images. Now, uh, the judge in the initial case decided that uh, Richard Prince had infringed Patrick Carey's copyright. Uh, this case is, you know, currently under appeal, so we're not sure how it's all going to play out in the end. But um, you know, for me, as someone who works with appropriation art, one of the most kind of chilling things about this case is that the judge not only said that Richard Prince had infringed the photographer's copyright, she also awarded all of the intellectual property rights to the original photographer. 
So if we look at something like this, you know, we do see that Rastafarian again repeated a few times, but the women are taken from vintage pornography and there's quite a bit of overpainting on this one. Um, I think it's kind of crazy to say that this painting is more a product of Patrick Carey, the photographer and his creativity, than it is of Richard Prince. So you know, I think this is a bad decision and uh, it's my hope that on appeal it will be overturned in, uh, in, and wind up in Richard Prince's favor. Now I want to go back to the flowers for a minute. Um, this is a series that Andy Warhol started in 1964. Um, he made them in a number of different sizes and in hundreds of different color combinations, and he did this using a, a silk screen. Like the Marilyn Monroe images and many of his paintings from this time period, uh, this was not based on a photograph that Warhol took himself. It was something that he found in a magazine. Uh, now, the original photograph was actually rectangular. It had seven flowers, so he cropped it. He made some little alterations to the flowers themselves, but the original photographer came across the paintings. She uh, brought a lawsuit against Andy Warhol. This one was also settled out of court, so he wound up giving her a couple of paintings and uh, royalties on any future images. But this question of ownership is something that I think is, is quite a bit more complicated. And if we look at these images, you might think that these are all various pieces from the same series. Um, actually, only the one in the upper left is an Andy Warhol painting. So the one next to it with the pink flowers is by Elaine Sturdivant. She's an artist who is a contemporary of Warhol's. She asked him for one of his old silk screens. He gave it to her, and she then made a series of these paintings which she sold and exhibited under her own name. Now, only an expert you know, could tell the difference looking at these without seeing the signature on the back, right? It's the same size, it's uh, the same silk screen, it's you know, painted around the same time, but it's worth about a quarter of the value on the market as the actual Warhol, simply because it's not an Andy Warhol painting. The one on the lower left is by Richard Pettibone. Uh, it doesn't have any silk screen, it's all hand painted, and it's also less than two inches square. It's part of a series of miniature reproductions of contemporary paintings that he made. Um, and the one on the lower right is actually my own painting. Uh, it's part of a series of works called the Bootleg Series, which was what Phil was referring to in my introduction. Um, so these were kind of cheap knockoffs of work by all the contemporary artists. So it's Andy Warhol and Yoshitomo Nara and Elizabeth Payton and Damien Hirst. Um, and you know, for me, this project was sort of inspired by the guys selling the fake Louis Vuitton handbags down on Canal Street. And it was all about you know, art as commodity, art as status symbol, and sort of playing with those ideas. To me, this would be a fair use, um, but you know, luckily I haven't actually had to go to court and, and defend myself, you know, who knows what they would say. Um, but this question of ownership, I think, comes up again and again, especially in what we call postmodern art. So this is an image of the Mona Lisa by Vic Muniz, uh, execu executed in peanut butter and jelly. Now, is this a reproduction of the Mona Lisa by uh, Leonardo da Vinci, which, of course, it's more than 70 years since he passed away, that would be in the public domain. Uh, or is this a reproduction of the double Mona Lisa by Andy Warhol, which I don't know if Andy Warhol can claim copyright on this image, but if so, it would not expire until 2057. Um, <laughs> or Richard Prince, on the upper left is his photograph, on the lower left is a photograph that I made by photographing a vintage copy of the same advertisement, cropping it in the same way and blowing it up to the same size. So am I stealing Richard Prince's intellectual property? Am I stealing from Philip Morris? Am I stealing from the original photographer who uh, did it under contract and so doesn't actually own the copyright? Or is my piece saying something new and different that's not being said in any of the earlier instances of the photograph? Uh, and finally, this is a Google image search for Andy Warhol flowers. Uh, almost three million results in a quarter of a second. And I think, you know, regardless of the law, that with the rise of digital technology, there's absolutely no way as artists that we can expect to have complete control over what's done with our work after it leaves the studio. Um, and you know, moreover, I think that digital tools are really, they have amazing potential for the art world. And uh, I think that there's all sorts of wonderful things that can be made, and that rather than bringing lawsuits against a younger generation of artists, they should be encouraged to work not only with our ideas, but you know, incorporating our images if they so choose. And whether that means appropriating them, or collaging them, or remixing them, or creating a mashup, or whatever, I think that this kind of work should be encouraged and promoted, and not something that should be cracked down upon. Um, now, less than you think that, you know, I'm going to feel different when the shoe's on the other foot and like, oh, you're like the thief now, but what happens when someone steals from you? Um, it has actually happened to me a couple of times that my work has been appropriated. Um, this is a self-portrait that I did in the style of the artist Julian Opie. It's part of that same bootleg series. Um, style, by the way, cannot be copywritten or copyrighted, uh, just the actual execution of it. Um, this is a painting by a young uh, Spanish artist incorporating my image and also that of a couple other uh, contemporary artworks. Now, even if this guy is able to sell this painting for a million dollars, which I think is pretty unlikely, um, I don't see that harming me in any way or hurting my ability to 
sell my own work. Uh, so I don't see how that should be any kind of a problem. Um, and the other use, which is kind of even more bizarre, uh, this is a painting by Damien Hirst from a, uh, the Butterfly series, where he affixed actual butterflies onto monochrome canvases. Um, this is a screen grab from my website showing the bootleg version. These are much smaller. They're 9 by 12 inches, and they're made with paper cutouts instead of uh, actual butterflies. And uh, this is a uh, website that I came across on the internet a couple months ago. It's a gallery which has basically swiped the JPEGs from my website and <laughs> combined them into one on theirs. And they're purporting this to be a work by Damien Hirst that they have uh, for sale. So this is certainly not a use that I would ever have expected. Uh, I think it's possibly fraudulent. But you know, I can't help but see the humor in the fact that my appropriation has now been reappropriated as a work by the original artist. <laughs> Thank you.